Christmas is an exciting time. And our world has, has changed in my lifetime. Used to, you only had sales after Thanksgiving. Here it seems Christmas begins in September. In America, I remember receiving what appeared to be a forest in the mail. And that means we received catalog after catalog after catalog and couldn't stop the catalogs from coming in the mail. When I was a boy, the only catalog we got was a Sears and Roebuck catalog. Sears and Roebuck is not even in the memory of many folks today. Nor is 1967. How many of you came to life after 1967? I see those hands. All right. Some are raising their hands and some are saying he's going to cause, ask us to give again. We're not raising our hands. In 1967, I, I, a brown-eyed girl caught my eye and I was invited to her house at Christmas. Now, I slept at her grandmother's house because that was proper, but I visited her house quite a lot. I was a nervous guy being at that house. I'd never been to a girl's house where you were supposed to eat breakfast with them and lunch and dinner and talk with mom and dad and see all of the slides that had been taken since before she was born. <laughs> but they showed them endlessly. Her father did. Had a whole closet full of them. Now children don't even know what slides are. Let me tell you, they are time-consuming <laughs> and boring, but not if you're in love or infatuation or whatever it was. But I remember that Christmas season sitting in, on the couch and, and looking at their magazines on the coffee table. And lo and behold, there was, there was a magazine I'd never seen before. It was the Neiman Marcus Christmas Magazine for 1967. Now, I didn't even know what Neiman Marcus was. It was a fancy store. I don't know that anybody in her house ever bought anything from Neiman Marcus. But somehow she received that catalog, her mother received that catalog. Now, I opened that catalog and looked in it. There wasn't anything in my pocketbook that could afford anything in that magazine. It was outrageous. And I got to the certain special gift of the year. That year, in 1967, the gift of the year was two camels for four thousand US dollars. In 1967 you could live all year on four thousand dollars. What would anybody want with two camels? <laughs> when I took my daughter to Israel somebody offered me a thousand camels for her but we didn't take them. I didn't know what to do with them. <laughs> it, it, the Neiman Marcus catalog in 2006 offered you for 1.6 million dollars a trip into space. They didn't say you were coming back. <laughs> this year for $450,000 you can fly to Paris and get your very own fragrance. Yep. I think I'll leave my comments alone there because I would be corrected when I got home. <laughs> I can tell you this, people give all kinds of gifts, some that cost very little and some that cost a whole lot. eBay said in 2012, after Christmas, they did over one billion dollars in sales of gifts that people didn't want for Christmas. 
One billion dollars. Gifts, Christmas gifts. Today we, we take a moment not to go into Lane Crawford or Sogo or even the ladies market, but a moment to look into the scripture and look at the gifting that took place there. In Matthew chapter 2, beginning with verse 9, we read, After they heard the king, meaning the magi heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until they stopped over the place, till it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and incense and myrrh. Before I look at the gifting, I want you to catch something that we often miss in this story. Do you realize that what I have just read to you is part of a bookend in the way Matthew writes? Yes. When it talks about the Messiah, the Savior coming to the world, he's coming into a Jewish family, but who's coming to worship him? Gentiles. People from a foreign land. Now put that in your mind on one end. And how does the book of Matthew end? Read it with me. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Do you see how Matthew begins talking about Jesus for the whole world? And he ends telling us to take the message of Jesus to the whole world. It is a purposeful presentation by Matthew. Now let's look at verse 11. On coming out or to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Does it say, and coming to the manger? No. It says coming to the house. Jesus was apparently two years or less, meaning that he was a very busy little child at this time. His vocabulary would have been limited, but he would have known the word no quite well. Two-year-olds or 18-month-old can be quite, quite busy. But there's something else in the picture. When the Magi arrive, it says they saw the child with his mother and they bowed down and worshipped. Who did they worship? They worshipped Jesus. It does not say and they bowed down and worshipped Mary and Jesus. It says they bowed down and worshipped him. There is a reason for that because Jesus alone is the Savior. Jesus alone is our Lord. Now in the second part of the 11th verse, it says they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and incense and myrrh. Some of your translations will say frankincense and myrrh. And as soon as we read this, we open the door to history and to legends. Married, they come together. The scripture doesn't tell us how many magi there were. In the Western church, we talk about three because there are three gifts. In the Eastern church, they talk about 12. I'm not sure why. We, we, we believe they are Chaldeans or Assyrians. They probably have come maybe as much as 2,000 kilometers to, to visit this child. It may have taken them as much as two years. 
We, we know from history their positions were hereditary positions. We know that they were able to go into the king's court or the emperor's court. They were priestly cast, and they, they prophesied, and they cast omens, and they interpreted dreams, and, and they were a political force of so scientists and astrologers. And they studied the sky, and they studied life. Now let me step back into the, the history, the time in which Jesus was born. In the time in which Jesus was born, people saw the heavens and the earth as a single fabric. And thus, they believed you could read the heavens and understand what would happen on earth. And thus, the Magi were highly respected in that culture, the, the pagan culture, and recognized as people who were in tune with what take, put place in the world and how it took place in the world. Now, as we stop to look at these, we see three magi, probably men, who know little of the Messiah. But they have been led by God to this moment. Writers have given the names Melchior to one of them, the name Melchior to one of them. And He's painted as old and gray and a long beard from Persia and brings the gift of gold. In Persia, you would never go before the king without taking a gift of gold. Gold is a gift for royalty. And that is what he's expressing. Jesus is born to be king. Not in order to reign by force, but to reign by love. We will call him the King of Kings and Lord of Lords by the time we get to Revelation. The second Magi, Caspar, was young and ruddy, probably from India. And he brings incense. Incense, why? Because in the priestly world, the incense was burned in order to open the way to heaven in the way they understood the burning of incense. The priest was a bridge builder. When you read in Timothy's letter, Paul's letter to Timothy, Paul says, For there is one God and mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all men. It is a, a mediatorial statement that we have there. But then you have Belshazzar. The third Magi, they say he had a newly grown, grown beard. Now, I don't know who his barber was, and there are no autographed pictures. He's from Arabia, and he brings a gift of myrrh. Myrrh was a spice that you used to wrap a body in, in preparation for burial. And Peter tells us Jesus came into the world to die for our sins. In fact, Holman Hunt, in his uh, imagination, paints a picture of the teenage boy Jesus stretching in the carpenter shop, and the shadow falls across the wall, and Mary sees the shadow. Now, this is sanctified imagination, but it's still one of those pictures that rises up out of the legend to speak to us of the coming of Christ. What you want to notice about all three of these, when you put the legends aside, you want to notice that they came to give something to Jesus, not to get something from Jesus. Say it again. They came to give something to Jesus, not to get something from Jesus. We need to learn that lesson. That's an important lesson for us. For many times, what we want is what we can squeeze out of Jesus, not what we can bring to Jesus. Through the years, people have looked at these gifts and tried to understand these gifts. And one of the places that they have addressed these gifts 
is in their own gift giving with their children at home. They've looked at the gifts of gold and incense and myrrh. How does that make a difference with my children? Some families have developed a, a pattern, a, a tradition, that they would give three gifts at Christmas. One gift would be a gift of value, gold, a gift of value. It might be something that is of value to you. It might be of something of value to the child. The second gift, a gift, as we look at incense, a gift that can help the child grow in whatever age he or she is spiritually. How can I help my child grow closer to God? The third gift, myrrh, something for the body. My mother mastered that without ever knowing about this. She gave clothes, usually underclothes and socks at Christmas. We got lots of those because we had lots of Sunday underclothes and socks, meaning they were holy. There's a little humor in that. It's bad, but there's humor. Nevertheless, gifts, using the example as an example on how to give. Perhaps one of the most famous stories is a story that began, it's not biblical, it begins with these words, one dollar and 87 cents. And 60 cents were pennies. She counted it three times, one dollar and 87 cents. She sat in her apartment wrestling with the fact that it was Christmas Eve and she had nothing to give to her husband. She thought and she cried. Sobs and sniffles and smiles seemed to be a part of life, sometimes more sniffles than anything else. One dollar and 87 cents. You see, they lived in an eight dollar a week apartment. When they first moved there, her husband, James Dillingham Young, was making thirty dollars a month, hmm. but not anymore. Now he's making 20, and things were really, really tight. So tight she had nothing to give him for Christmas. As she would say, James Dillingham Young looked real good on the post office box, or that was the mailbox that was too small to receive mail. It was right next to the doorbell that didn't ring. But now it would have been better to have James D. Young because there wasn't much special about what was going on except they loved each other. She had beautiful hair. That was her most valuable asset. In fact, as O. Henry writes, he writes that, that her hair was so beautiful that if the Queen of Sheba lived next door, Della, that's her name, would wash and dry her hair and let it dry in the wind outside, that the Queen of Sheba would be jealous. And Jim, Jim had a watch. It was passed from his father, which passed from his grandfather. It was a gold watch. Why, if Solomon were next door, all of his jewels wouldn't be enough to compare with that watch. In fact, if he lived next door, when he walked out, Jim would always look at his watch and Solomon would be jealous. <laughs> and she thought and she thought, what can I do? And then in a moment, 
The color drained from her face, and she stood and she raced to the door. And she went to a place that worked with hair, asked how much she could sell her hair for. $20, she was told. Do it quick, she said. And with that, her hair was gone. Two hours later, she was knocking on doors, looking for the right gift. You know what it was. She wanted a watch chain for Jim's watch. She looked and she looked until she found just the right one. It wasn't ornate. It was simple. But it was just right. And it cost $21. She went home with 87 cents in her, in her purse. She got home and, and she got her curling irons out and she began to work on her hair. It, it was pretty short. She was afraid he would say, you look like a dance hall girl. But she fixed it as best she could. Frying pan was on the back burner on the oven. Wasn't on. The gas wasn't on. She sat down at the table worrying, will he still love me? Will he still think I'm, I'm pretty? Will he? She listened for his footsteps. She held the watch chain in her hand. When she heard his footsteps, Opened the door. That coat, it was worn. And he didn't have any gloves for his hands. Not any at all. He needed gloves. He looked at her. And, and, and the look froze in place. He said, Your hair. She said, it looks good. It's still me in here. It's still me. Do you like it? Before he could take off his coat, she'd hugged him. He hugged her back. And he pulled something from under his coat and, and tossed it on the table. And she talked to him. Obviously, he was shocked. He said, open the paper. She opened it. And she stood wordless as she looked at the tortoise shell combs with jewels that she'd stared at in the shop window for months and months and months. Three of them, just right for the hair that was gone now. She reached down and handed him the watch chain. He said, I sold the watch for the coins, for the combs. And with that, O. Henry is seeking to help us understand something of what the Magi did. They gave of their best, not to each other, not to, to one they loved, for they didn't know him. But they gave of their best to the one they believed was King of kings and Lord of lords. And that brings us to, to why. I don't know why except that God laid it on their hearts. The Magi have been labeled as those God used to make provision, and God is the provider. And certainly if we read past the Christmas story and look carefully at verse 13, we recognize when they, the Magi, had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take this child and his mother and escape to Egypt. 
stay there until I tell you for Herod is going to search for the child and kill him. Some have said, the Magi, well, they're delivering God's care package to the parents, the poor parents that they may escape to Egypt. Well, certainly what they give is enough to take care of whatever needs they have in Egypt. But the Magi would have been insulted with the idea that they're giving a care package to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That would have cheapened their gift. They gave of their best. John Piper has an interesting approach to giving that I want to leave you with today as we bring this message to a conclusion. He writes, The joy I feel comes not from the hope of getting rich with things from you. Can you say that to Jesus? The joy I feel does not, comes not from the hope of getting rich with the things from you. The joy I feel is tied to who you are, not what you can give me. I give these gifts to enjoy you more instead of the things they could buy. By giving you what you do not need and what I might enjoy, I'm saying, you are my treasure, not these things. You are my treasure, not these things. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, treasures, treasures on earth sparkle and catch our eye, stir our imagination, and enlarge our waters. But in the long term, they cannot satisfy. On this day, We come to you as we are. The gift we offer you is, is not something we purchase in some store. It's not printed by a bank. The gift is our hearts. And with our hearts, we give you everything we are and everything we have. We give it not for what we can get, but because we've learned to love because you've loved us first and we want to love you in Jesus name Amen